not call most of these people Arabs. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. Okay, let me break this down so you can quickly get the distinction. You've heard of Persia, right? The Persian Empire, Persian rugs, Persian cats, the Prince of Persia, which by the way, Disney got incredibly accurate. Yes, Persia is pretty much synonymous with Iran. Now, not everyone in Iran is Persian, but it's a huge part of their story, which we will begin discussing now. Okay, let's be frank. Iran seems to get their fair share of the news quite often in the Western media. However, conflict issues aside, Iran has a deep history and story in the Middle East that extends millennia in the past that would probably be wise to educate yourself on. First of all, Iran is located in Western Asia, bordered by seven other countries, as well as the Caspian Sea to the north, the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman to the south, divided by the Strait of Hormuz, which is like one of the most important sea passages in the world. Hey! It's Arabian Gulf. Eh, most people have called it Persian Gulf and it's been that way for centuries. Plus, Arabs have their own sea. Just let them have it. <sighs> The country is divided into 31 provinces, with the capital Tehran located in the north central region. Now keep in mind, before Tehran, Iran actually had 30 previous capitals throughout their history, more than any other country in the world. Otherwise, Iran also divides the country into five non-constituent unit regions for administrative purposes, each one containing six provinces, except for one region containing seven, which also includes the capital. Finally, although they are administered by Iran, the country also has a current dispute over the Abu Musa and the greater and lesser Tum Islands with the United Arab Emirates, nearby the Strait of Hormuz in the Persian Gulf. After Tehran, the largest cities are Mashhad in the east and Isfahan in the center. And the largest airports are, of course, Tehran's two twins, Mehrabad and Iman Khomeini International, Mashhad International, and Shiraz International. Iran also takes ownership of about 30 or so islands in the Gulf and technically one island in the Caspian Sea, Ashur Ade Island, which, however, it's kind of more like a loose peninsula. One thing you have to understand is that Iran takes their position and borders very seriously, as they are kind of like a land bridge located right at the crossroads between the Middle East, the Caucasus, as well as the Central and South Asian regions. The most important and largest seaport would be Bandar Abbas, which also houses the Iranian Navy, located right at the entrance at the Strait of Hormuz. Otherwise, due to its incredible history, Iran is overflowing with landmarks and sites. Some of the top notable ones might include places like Naqsh Jahan Square, Milad Tower, Golestan Palace, Persian Garden, the Armenian Monastic Ensembles of Iran, the Tomb of Hafez, the Azadi Tower Freedom Monument, the Pigeon Tower, Yazd, the holiest place for Zoroastrians, Choga Zanbil Zikrat, the Mayaman Cave Village, the Imam Reza Shrine, the Khaju Bridge, Argebam, the Shushtar Hydraulic System, the Tomb of Cyrus the Great, the Tomb of Daniel, too many famous mosques and shrines to list, and pretty much everything in Persepolis. Iran was able to build so much of their own personal space, partially due to the fact that they were easily well protected by natural boundaries, or barricaded in. You decide. Let's explain in. <laughs> You know what's funny? The world's hottest surface temperature ever recorded was 70.7 .7 degrees Celsius in the Lut Desert in Iran, and yet Iran is also like the best ski resort area in the Middle East. First of all, Iran's most important topographical barriers are the Zahros Mountains in the west, which also contain the largest lake, Urmia, and the mountains also feed the longest river, the Karun in the south, which flows into the Gulf, as well as the Alborz Mountains along the north, which contain the largest mountain, Mount Damavand, which is also the tallest volcano in all of Asia, like it's still active. There's so much mining potential in the these mountains as well, which makes Iran the largest producer of turquoise and zinc. Otherwise, they have two main deserts, the Kavir and Lut, located in the central plateau, and the only real flat part of Iran is in the Khuzestan region right next to Iraq. Iran is right on the boundary of the Arabian and Eurasian tectonic plates, which in return makes Iran the country with the most number of major earthquakes of at least 5.5 on the Richter scale annually. <laughs> Mine are bigger. Yeah, well, mine are explodier. Now, Iran is kind of like the strange anomaly that sticks out from the rest of the Middle East because it has alpine mountains with flowers and snow and water and green, especially in the north along the coast of the Caspian. I mean, sure, there are dry, arid deserts too, but overall, Iran is a lot more lush. This allows them to harbor river valleys for agriculture, which makes them the number one producer of pistachios, saffron, stone fruits. By the way, Iranians love saffron. They put it in like half of everything. Speaking of which, some top foods from Iran might include things like pomegranate walnut stew, kuku, mirza Semi, various rice dishes like jeweled rice, bakala, lubia, shirin, various kebabs like juje, kubide, torsh, and bakhriyari, desserts like rosewater pudding, khalva, sarshir, bami, nohochi, and falude. By the way, half those dishes had saffron in them. Alcohol is technically banned, however, people kind of smuggle it in and have their connections. Even the cops are kind of getting tired of trying to crack down, and many just look the other way and deal with other bigger things. Two other things Iran cannot live without tea and caviar. In fact, Iran is the largest producer of caviar in the world, mostly 
mostly from sturgeons fished off the coast of the Caspian. Speaking of which, Iran surprisingly has quite an array of wildlife, including gazelles, wolves, falcons, storks, buzzards, and of course the famous Persian cat. Speaking of cats, Iran is home to some of the last only few remaining surviving Persian lions, which is by the way the national animal, Persian leopards, and yes, even Asiatic cheetahs. Wait, aren't those like African animals? Actually, a lot of animals we affiliate with Africa had historically roamed all across the Middle East and Southern Asian regions, which is why today we have elephants in India, rhinos in Indonesia. Unfortunately, most of them have been killed off or incredibly endangered. The more you, unfortunately, no! The biggest natural resource, though, would have to be, no surprise, oil. Iran is the second largest oil producer in the Middle East after Saudi Arabia, and about 60% of their total reserves are located around the Persian Gulf. It's estimated that the country should have about 125 billion barrels in reservoirs, 10% of the world's total reserves, and they pump out about 4 million barrels a day. That's a lot. So with all the geographic isolation, but abundance of resources, you might wonder, what is life like in Iran? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Now, Iran is interesting because it's caught in this strange new transition period in which everything in the new generation of millennials has a tincture of subtle defiance. First of all, Iran has about 80 million people and is the second most populated country in the Middle East after Egypt and has the highest number of Shias in the world. About 62% of the country is ethnically Persian, whereas the second largest ethnic groups are the Azeris at about 16%, Kurds at about 10%, while the remainder is made up of smaller but noticeable groups like the Lurs, the Baluchis, Arabs, Turkic groups, and others. They also use the Iranian Rial as their currency. They use the Type C EF outlets and they drive on the right side of the road. Now let's emphasize this one more time. Persians are not Arabs. That's like the worst thing you can say to them. First of all, what is it like to be a Persian? Well, you kind of have to understand that Iran evolved a lot differently from all the other countries in the Middle East. History will take way too long to explain, but the quickest way I can put it, proto elamites Elam, Median Empire, Persian or Achaemenid Empire, Alexander the Great, the Seleucid, Parthian, and Sassanid Empires, Islam enters through the Umayyad Caliphate, the Abbasid Caliphate, Safarids and Samanids come in from the east, then some weird splitting up, the Ghaznavid, Seljuk, and Khwarezmian Empires, Mongols! the Ilkhanid, Timurid, Safavid, and Afsharid empires, the Zand and Qajar dynasties, Quick Pahlavi dynasty, Islamic Republic, a little drama here and there, and here we are today. Now the biggest distinction of Iran would probably be the language. The official language of Iran is Persian or Farsi, an Indo-European language also spoken in Afghanistan and Tajikistan, although they have their own dialects, which is completely unintelligible to Arabic. The second largest distinction would be that they are the largest Shia Muslim country in the world with doctrines that run their ideologies and legislation. If you don't know the difference between Sunnis and Shias, basically, Shias believe that Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law Ali was supposed to be the rightful successor rather than Abu Bakr who became the first caliph. If you don't know what any of that means, let me make it even easier. Shias, this guy. Sunnis, no, this guy. Done. The interesting thing though is that Persians still hold on to a lot of ancient Persian customs and traditions that predate even Islam. For example, for over 3,000 years, Persians and other Persian related people groups across the world still celebrate Nowruz or Persian New Year, usually on March 21st or the vernal equinox. A mostly secular holiday, however, it actually has roots and is considered holy to Zoroastrians. Zoroastrianism actually started in Iran and at one point was actually the state religion. Persians also have their own distinct art, which usually depicts human figures more often than other Sunni cultures. They have their own traditions, clothing, music, opera, poetry, sports. I mean, polo was invented here and they have that ancient warrior training thing. They have handicrafts. I mean, everybody knows that Persian rugs are like some of the most sought after in the world. But remember, not all Iranians are Persians and some of these groups have expressed separatist movement desires in the past, but with pretty much no actual success. The second largest group, the Turkic Azeris or Azerbaijanis, mostly live in the Northwest along the borders of Turkey and the Caucasus regions where their cousins, the actual Azerbaijanis in Azerbaijan live. They are basically the same people, except one group speaks Farsi. Although exact numbers are kind of hard to estimate, today there are about twice as many to three times more Azeris living in Iran than there are in Azerbaijan. Then you have the Kurds that live along the west as well, and then you have the Arabs that mostly inhabit the flat Khuzestan areas by Iraq. You have the Baluchi people in the southwest along the border with Pakistan. Each of these people groups has their own language, culture, and history. Oh, and keep in mind, Persia is mentioned numerous times in the Bible. Iranian Jews believe that they are descended from Queen Esther, and they, as well as Christians, believe that King Cyrus was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Speaking of which, although the vast majority of the population is Shia Muslim, there are communities of non-Muslims, mostly Christians and Jews. However, outside religions are strictly monitored and confined to only a few places of worship as it is illegal to build churches or synagogues. Selling of literature is illegal and apostasy from a Muslim is punishable. Which is funny because just like in China, Iran has one of the fastest growing underground Christian communities in the world and disputedly the most in the Middle East. So how does Iran hold all these people together? Well, in order to speed up the Persian 
assimilation process. Other languages are banned from schools and they have a system in which cooperation is rewarded and resistance is punished by the IRGC. So it's kind of like, join us and the rewards shall be bountiful. Um, I have my own thing going on, but thanks. Join us and the rewards shall be bountiful. Speaking of which, the government is a little confusing. You have both the regular legislators and then you have the theocratic leaders. Essentially, the Ayatollah has the most power. He is not only the leader of the country, but also the entire Shia community inside and outside of Iran. He's selected by a community of clerics called the Assembly of Experts, whom also have authority to approve all of the presidential candidates during election time. From there, the president appoints people to the various ministries and offices, whereas the Ayatollah appoints the military leader and handles all other various duties. I don't want to say the Ayatollah Ayatollah is like the Pope of the Shia faith, but in some ways he kind of is. This is kind of where the Islamic Revolution comes into play and where all the modern drama with Iran kind of starts. Long story short, they took down the Shah, which they believed was a Western puppet figure, and then they instituted a more conservative Islamic Republic. This changed everything. The thing is, this was all nearly half a century ago. Today, an entirely new generation of modernized, digital, tech-savvy Iranians has entered the stage, and the country is seeing a completely new culture shift that they can't stop. About 70% of the country is under 30 years old, Old, many of whom don't really even like the rules, which means you have a lot of intrepid youths running the show now. Even the police are getting way more lenient because the police are getting younger too. Everyone in Iran is now kind of trying to find like loopholes and subtle cheats to avoid the religiously imposed laws. Although the hijab is required for all women in public, most women just loosely wear it exposing their necks and front hair, almost as if it's like a fashion accessory rather than a religious article. Skateboarding, punk rock, and metal culture has already penetrated the youth, even women. Although it's interesting because it's like Persian punk rock in metal. People meet at underground clubs and parties all the time wearing whatever they want with open bars and music. If you catch them in their element, Persians are actually seriously like some of the most fun people you'll ever meet. And the crazy thing is everybody knows about this. It's nothing shockingly new to the police or government. It gives them a little bit of a headache, but after half a century, it's kind of like, dude, Whatever. Yeah, you didn't really expect that, did you? Persian punk rock rebels with hijabs and skateboards, right? And that's what goes on in the inside. Now let's see how they reach out. Now here's where things get a little tricky because in order to understand Iran's outside relations, again, you kind of have to look at Iran through the lens of both pre and post 1979 revolution. First of all, Iraq is sometimes called Arab Iran, although don't say that to them, as they have the second highest population of Shias and hold two incredibly important holy Shia sites. They've mostly moved on from the war in the 80s and the two have good ties, mostly. Afghanistan and Tajikistan are like their cousins that have different political views and it's awkward when they have dinner together, but nonetheless, they still mostly get along. Russia and Venezuela are probably the best friends outside of the Middle East, as Hugo Chavez frequently visited Ahmadinejad and made numerous trade deals. The Iranian car company Hodro is imported and partially manufactured in Venezuela. And Russia was like a key ally in many of the war conflicts post-revolution. Surprisingly, they are also one of the few countries that have kind of decent ties to North Korea. They've pledged cooperation in education and cultural spheres in the past. The Azerbaijanis of the North, of course, love Azerbaijan, no surprise. Bahrain is like Saudi Arabia's girlfriend that they keep trying to flirt with and steal. When it comes to their best friends though, most Iranians I talked to have said probably Syria and Turkey, although it's a little complicated, especially with all the current drama going on. Turkey and Iran have more or less always been on good terms, especially in business. They are working on a plan to enter the European petroleum industry to rival Russia. Each country makes up a large population of tourists that visit each other every year. Syria, or more specifically, the Syrian government has more or less worked alongside with Iran numerous times in the past and has been a key ally, not only in diplomacy, but also strategically as they kind of give them access to the Mediterranean. In conclusion, Iran is kind of like a land that is constantly trying to figure out a way to reconcile the revolutionary ideals upon a fast-paced social media induced generation of quiet culture rebels while simultaneously dealing with outside stigma. What will Iran look like in 20 years? I don't know, but one thing we do know is that the young people will be ruling it. Stay tuned, Iraq is coming up next.